or uh, I mean, oh, yeah, you were all joining uh, afternoon, you know, right? Yeah, there's nothing. Nobody knew, no. So yeah, thanks again uh, for coming. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to celebrate with you the 10th anniversary of the Datentreiber. I started Datentreiber you know, 10 years ago. Uh, I noticed because my son is also 10 years old, so it's easy to remember. Uh, when I started Datentreiber, I started it part time. Uh, I started it alone. Um, but uh, and someday I learned if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, then go together. And that's why uh, I extended the team over the last years. We invited experts um, we have to join our expert network. Some of them are here. Uh, for example, Lutz, who is uh, I think one of the first experts, or maybe you are the first, I don't know, maybe Frank uh, or uh, Lutz, I think both you were one of the first experts. But also uh, Philip, uh, Lisa uh, are our experts. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, for joining today. And of course, also we extended uh, the team, the Daten Driver team, the core team. Uh, a special thanks uh, to Georg, who joined uh, two years ago. He was an expert first, uh, but then um, joined Datentreiber. And I did a mistake, you know. <laughs> <laughs> as a shareholder and as a managing director. And especially uh, last year when I had a little bit uh, troubles with health, a lot of health issues. Uh, here ran, ran, ran the company and I was very happy that you are on my side, so thank you very much. Pleasure to you. But I also like to thank uh, my other colleagues, uh, for example, uh, Benjamin, who sits here, uh, who helped me to design the new Data AI business design bench over the last year. Thank you very much for this one. And of course, Doreen, by the way, we have a new website, and that's thanks to Doreen. Thank you very much. She also um, helped to organize the event, uh, and the main organizer of the event uh, is another colleague, Kati Beck. Thank you very much for organizing. We did all uh, great jobs, uh, great job. So also a lot of um, yeah supporter since uh, yeah, multiple years is Ulrike. Uh, I know Ulrike. I think we met 20 years ago at a conference, <laughs> and yeah, I think we, we stayed in contact uh, via Facebook. And one day I learned that Ulrike had a special project in India, and she will tell you a little bit about this project. And the interesting thing about this project is it is a good example of how you transform an organization and whether it's a, a small village in India or a big corporate in Germany, I think the challenges are similar. And yeah, we as Daten I was started as a strategy consulting company, but we, but we learned the hard way over the last few years uh, that the strategy is the easy part, the hard part is the transformation. And um, that's why I invited Ulrike to tell us how she mastered transformation. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good evening. I'm sorry, it's a horrible time slot. I know everyone is waiting for dinner. So, uh, but you had your drinks, so I hope you can stay a little bit cool. Transformation. Uh, maybe to be very clear from the beginning, transformation, when I say transformation, I really mean change. It's not like, you know, changing a little, some screws somewhere, but really going into different kind of behavior, different kind of strategies, really that you basically replace some old values to guide you with new ones. And uh, this is what I did before I went to India. I worked with Google, I worked with NATO, with smaller companies as well. And I was always involved how to drive change. Change in a way that you do things differently. So when I came to India, for me, the village was very much the same than an organization. You know, it's somehow a closed entity and uh, things just keep on going. Uh, what we did in India is, I just came back 
two weeks ago and it was the first time I went back for since four years and I went on a book tour, we just published a book and I realized how many people, when we even came to big cities like Delhi, Bombay or uh, how well known the project was and how impactful the Indian people saw what we were doing. So we really went from a nameless Indian village, we transformed in India's number one skateboarding village. And a ska it's much, much more than a skateboarding village, as you will see. That's the village. It's one of 700,000 villages in India, like 1,200 people there. All the problems in the world, you can imagine, they are there. So people, it's, it's very, very low income, 60% below the poverty line. It's deeply divided by caste. So you have certain areas where only the tribal, the Adivasi people are living. Then there are sectors where the caste People, even though it's a lower caste, the Yadav caste are living. The Yadav caste, they control everything. They really dictate what other people have to do. If it's not working like this, they will beat them up or, you know, find their way getting things done. So, like so, finance. Huh? Like finance in the <laughs> <laughs> uh, It's a little bit like you have these different departments, you know, and they do not talk to each other. The same thing. <laughs> uh, so this is what we did. The good news is such a transformation, it's possible, it's doable. The bad news is it does take time and it's a lot of work. So this is nothing, same for corporates, which you can do overnight. So when you see a village like this, you even see the state park. And the, you might wonder when all these problems are there, why a state park? Why not a school? Why not a hospital? Why not, you know, any kind of program for the Adivasi girls or whatsoever? My thought was, and I came from the cultural point of view, if you do have such a close entity, as an Indian village, where nothing comes in and nothing comes out. You really need a disruptor to shake this thing up. And my assumption was, if you bring into the village the extreme opposite, cultural-wise, of what they have, then something needs to happen. <laughs> so the skate park, the culture of skateboarding, wherever you go in the world, it's the extreme opposite from any Indian village. Skateboarding is all about finding your own way, you know, being a little bit rebellious, you don't follow the mainstream. It's really, really two different kind of entities. So I thought if I bring these two together, and we have a space in the village where everyone can come, so I didn't fence the place, I just made sure that we had two rules because I didn't want to get in trouble with the local school. I said, kids, if you do not go to school, you're not allowed to skateboard. School attendance went up by 50% until today. <laughs> the second rule was girls first because the girls, they don't have any rights in these villages. They go so far if it's probably the second girl in a family the girl will lose his life, her life. Uh, so, to just to assure that a girl would get a skateboard, we said girls first. So whenever a girl was saying girls first, she would get a skateboard from any kind of guy. And this worked. So, we brought this in. I made sure that it's inclusive, that there was no gatekeeper at any point who would say you can come, you cannot come, you can come, no. So everyone was allowed to come. There was uh, no fence. Uh, and all of a sudden, we had, for the very first time, in this village, a space where everyone was allowed to come. 
And since skateboarding is very, very attractive, so for the kids it's super cool, you know, if they can go on such a skateboard. They were attracted, so the kids were coming. Uh, my role, and I think this was very important right from the beginning, I never went into the village with a certain kind of program. All I did is I built the skate park on private land. So no one could screw me for this, it was private land. So worst case scenario would have been no one is coming, you know, we have the skateboard, this is it we need. So, but they were coming. Uh, now I'm stuck. What did I say last? They were coming? Uh, Girls first. That's right. Girls first, it's and then property. I said. Uh, it was a private property. It was a private property, so everyone was allowed to come. We had for the very first time an open space where everyone could come. And there was no one who was pre selecting. So we had these rules, and the people were coming. Not only the kids were coming, they brought their sisters, all the casts were there, the parents were there. And all of a sudden, when they come together, they will have conversations, right? So out of these conversations, certain things were happening. I never predefined saying, we are addressing the Alibasi girls, or we are addressing the boys or the old women. No. We said, whoever wants to come, whoever wants to do something, please come and we'll figure it out. So we had all of a sudden this open space, people were coming and they came up with ideas. And then my role was to bring the villagers, but also my network, which was available, bring them all together and define solutions. Because for me, it was very important that I wasn't designing solutions for them, but with them. And this made it, now that we are 10 years down the road, really much more sustainable. That was the reason these three things, that I was working with the entire village, that, uh, that we included the people in the programs, and that we had these certain rules for this open space while the skate park uh, worked out. So, what happened over the last 10 years? Our kids, who usually, they cannot read and write even if they, you know, pass school. Uh, they went, they were the first Indians who represented India at the World Championships in China, so they traveled abroad, they were, became really good skateboarders, they, many of the kids have won gold medals and silver and bronze medals at the national championships, so sports-wise, in this little village, is the biggest pool of India skateboarders. There is no kid who cannot skateboard. We meanwhile have our own deck at Dekasla, where it says who will change makers, so whenever someone is buying a deck, the kids will get money. Here is our rule goals first. So what really happened in the village <coughs> that not only have we, uh, a couple of girls refused to say, I'm not getting married, uh, they really have become a voice in the village. So when there are problems which need to be solved, the women now have a voice. The men are listening. So this has really brought, I mean, it's not equal rights yet, but it's a huge, huge step forward. And the women and the girls, they know that the possibility is there. The rule, no school, no skateboarding, uh, that's actually the local government school there. As I said before, swam the kids into the school. 50% school attendance went up. And we also, we ourselves, we had set up uh, what we called an open school project with these five kids, which was supported by Daten Treiber over many years. For these five kids, we have defined a program. First of all, where these kids 
uh, really where we were trying to close the gaps they have in their uh, traditional subjects like math or Hindi and in the sciences. And the other uh, part of their time, we really put into the topics they wanted to do. So like any kind of creative stuff, media production, they had uh, virtual reality workshops, they had, they had conflict management, because these kids were selected with the, with the perspective that they have. We thought those were the ones who had the best social skills to become some kind of key figures in the village. So this open school project was running for four or five years, and part of the open <coughs> school project was also that each week, one of these kids would go back in the village. They were all in Delhi, which is a night train from our village. They would go back for one week. They had to find a program which they would implement in the village. They implement in the one week, and then they come back, and another kid is going. So there was a constant back and forth between village and the village kids and the school. We have a community center, which is solar powered, where kids train and teach kids because that's the much better way in getting education going there. The biggest problem is not building a new school, but having the right or the good teachers. So we really did, you know, kids teaching kids, and this is working well until today. Uh, that's part of our community center where the kids really spoke up against their parents. Alcohol is a big, big problem in the village. So the guys who do not have any kind of work, they sit around and play cards, they drink, and they simply like the community center because there was solar power, there were fans running, so it was quite comfortable sitting there. So the kids spoke up, which is quite, quite unusual in this, uh, in this area and where fighting uh, for their rights. They have a sense of waste. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been in India, how a village looks like. It's pretty much a mess. Uh, this village no more, or much, much less. Uh, so, a lot of things happened. We broke down the uh, caste barrier. So, within this group of people, you see Adivasi, three Adivasi kids, two <coughs> caste kids. They were staying together in an apartment in Delhi. They were cooking together, they were sleeping together. This was something which was literally unheard of in India. So we broke this down. That was the biggest thing I would say for India, what we have to do. And this you see now uh, almost in the entire village. This is the part which I believe is really, really very, very uh, important when we talk about transformation. So any of these programs which we have designed, let it be the, the garbage, the waste thing, let it be the open school project, I always followed these nine principles. <clears throat> it's like a checklist for every strategy you define, you really need to tick. You need to check, do, does my strategy, whatever I do, fulfill all these nine criteria. What do I mean with systems or objects? For me, I'll give you the example for the village. It's very, very important that you include everyone, the entire system. If you only go for a special segment or for a special group, it won't work. So you really put the system and not a single object in the center of all your work. Meaning in a company, I don't believe if the Deutsche Telekom or other big companies who have done this, they have created the innovation labs outside the company, very often in a very, you know, trendy uh, loft or whatever. They put the people in there and then they wondered why nothing was happening in the company. 
So you really have to do this open and run surgery. And as you walk along, you can adjust because everyone is involved. So you really have to look at this entire thing and do not go for a special segment. Disobedience over compliance is also uh, something which uh, many HR departments also <laughs> might struggle with because you do need, or management people struggle with, you need employees who are a little bit disobedient, right? If they only do what you tell them what to do, how will they drive the company forward? No way. So encourage disobedience, make the rules clear, but let them unfold their way and then try to move it. I think it's a very, very important thing. Uh, emergence over authorities. When you create such an open space like we did at the skate park, you never know what will come out of this. So whatever emerges, you have to take serious. And whoever takes responsibility from the things which are emerging, emer emerging let them take responsibility for this, no matter if their job title suits this new project. So don't let predefined organizational structures hinder the personal development and with the personal development, the development of the company. So really, emergence is key. Forget about it. I do understand that functions, that a certain kind of structure is needed for certain kind of things, but you really need to balance this out towards emergency. I think pull over push is very clear in this case. We only, in Chanba, that's the name of the village, we only took projects, we only realized projects which were coming out of this pool. So I never ever said we need a new school or we do this or this or this. No, we always waited what the people would come up with mm -hmm. and then we would define it. So out of this pool, we took everything which came, we discussed it. We did for every project, we did workshops. Sometimes I had three, four hundred villagers. The biggest problem was that they could, we did design thinking workshops, how to do this open school project. So the biggest problem was very often that they can't write, right? So we had this paper, we had all the pencils, but no one could write. So uh, you can figure these things out, but you might be amazed what they have in their minds. And if you don't get it out, you might you know, lose very, very important aspects, and you might lose that they take ownership and they are working on something. This is, uh, I believe today, looking back these couple of years, that they have taken ownership is a very, very crucial point that the project is still running. I wasn't there for four years because I wasn't allowed to come back after COVID. The project is still running. Not to the detail when I was there, but they, you know, uh, took their own turns and they are still working on this. And this alone tells me from nothing eight years ago or nine years ago, that's quite a lot. Uh, I think that's very sensitive. I'm yeah, I, <laughs> uh, I think also a very important one is this practice over theory. If you do make plans, you get a theory, right? But you, if, if you do things, you really get practice. You learn what is working, you learn what is not working, you reduce tremendously your costs of failure if you move forward simply by practicing and constantly checking is it working, is it not working, are we on track? So it's really, we learned a lot simply by doing things. 
And sometimes the theory will tell you this is not working because you need a permission for this and this. But then when you start doing it, all of a sudden all the doors open. We have done things in the village where usually the collector, which is the head of, of a city or so, would say, oh my god, no. But then he saw how the, how the people responded and what kind of impact this program had for the village and the surrounding area, then he would say yes. So if you do things and if you show results, usually things will work for you. Martin, you said another one, which is, which you like. Oh, the me, we thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very important one. I do believe that it takes a strong me, a strong employee, to create a better we, a better company or better village. Uh, and this means for the HR departments, but also for management or whatsoever, that it's crucial that the that HR, that any kind of education for employees really makes them fit to question decisions, to ask questions, to be disobedient, and to give them responsibility when they want to have responsibility, no matter if it's their current job or not. And you see these examples also within companies. It's working if employees are giving these uh, things. So you really need these strong, strong, strong employees, uh, which not necessarily have the best university degrees, but they fit very often much, much better to the existing culture which you have in your company and they are usually the better people for, for the company themselves because it's much, much easier to, that they learn certain kind of things than it would be to change their mindset that they would fit uh, to the corporate culture. So, Gone again. With these nine principles, this was really at the core of everything we've been doing in the village. So for every strategy, for every project, we really went through. Do we tick this? Do we yes, yes, yes. And then once you follow this, transformation will happen. Not always in the way you might think about it, but it's moving forward in a very, very organic way. That's also something I have learned over the years, that transformation or, you know, it's not a linear way. It's very, very organic. And it's also very important that you have your vision, that you know where you want to go, but you do not need necessarily to detail out how I'm going to reach there at the beginning. This you can really do step by step by step. And this is how I think yeah, transformation becomes possible. Thank you and happy birthday. didn't fall from heaven, right? They did not. <laughs> they did not, heaven. right? So they like developed many, over time? Yes, many years ago uh, I worked together with the MIT Media Lab uh, in, in Boston. They are together with Harvard. They are very, very active in India. They want to get all the rich kids over there to study. So they do a lot of initiatives. And the head of the MIT Media Lab back then was Joe Ido. He's a close friend of mine. <coughs> and we were working together on a, on a workshop for the Kumbha Mela. The Kumbha Mela is the biggest religious gathering in the world. Like 30 million people are coming together. 
and at times, at one day, a city of two million people would pop up to 15 million people. How do you handle this? How do you handle this with waste, with food, with you know all these people navigating stuff like this? So we had workshops over two and a half years with the MIT, with Harvard, with uh, with the local students. We had 250 students from India, and uh, the goal was that we create solutions which would handle these uh, pop-up cities, how we called it. And while we were doing this, we were creating parallel, we were talking about these nine principles. So I have modified them a little bit for my own purposes in the village, but it's basically very much the same how the MIT Media Lab how IDEO is another company, they are very uh, working with these kind of things. When they try transformation, this is their checklist. Mm -hmm. This is how it came. Very much similar to the training as IDEO. Yes. Yeah, similar. Um, yeah. And it's basically also when you look at design thinking also. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the same things. And it's really, I mean, I went so far, I really had this sticker on my laptop, you know, <laughs> that you go through it and uh, when you stick with it, it's going to work because it makes you really flexible, you, you really become fast, uh, you, you spend less money because the cost of failure are really going down. Uh, and you really involve people, so you create uh, social value for the people. And this is something which is very, very often undervalued. Yeah. And when I read um, your nine principles, because I read uh, this book, by the way, just a little promotion, if you want to know the real skater story, not the, the skater girl movie, this <laughs> is the real story. And also, she brought a few books, if you want to buy one, uh, talk to Enrique. But when I, um, you sent me your book, and when I read this um, book, there uh, the the mind principle explained in more detail. And when I read it, uh, well, I, so a few things came to my mind because I, so for example, systems or objects that is exactly something what we try with our uh, data design thinking approach is not to isolate the one use case of just with data, but we also look at the, the users, the data, the business understanding. That's exactly the same. So you have to try to understand the whole system, not only an aspect or a part of it. Or the same um, for, I also like this concept over maps, because I mean, you said it, you can't, I mean, everybody has a plan until he gets someone uh, a punch, right? There's the same, I mean, this was every plan, every plan has some. Um, uh, faults in it, so it's much more important to have a compass, like a vision, where it's okay, this is this is where I want to head to, and if there are multiple ways that maybe I have to change my plan. And that's also, a, except again, I think HR is really, really challenged, right? Uh, because when you look at programs from HR departments, they don't think about compasses. There's hardly any HR initiative which would get an employee ready to go by a compass. But these are the kind of skills we need in this, in this world, right? Uh, so I think the biggest challenge besides management in companies is really HR. <laughs> no, seriously. At least resources. Yes. And there are just a few people, they don't have any budget at all, even they don't have any data or analytics, that's what, what we see. And even if, they, if they're a cost cut, where does they It's the cut? first thing it's which they cut training. off and it's they HR. throw away their, I mean, yeah. their biggest potential. Yeah. It's, it's, well, it's sometimes it hurts to see. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the, the people are the fundament of your business. I mean, if the, this fundament is unstable, everything else, the organization gets unstable, the technology of business. And that's also another thing I have learned, you know. I mean, I didn't speak the language. I get what they say, and we talk with hands and legs, and, uh, 
you it's real it doesn't matter when you drive transformation it really does not matter who will be in the first meeting with you those people who come those are the right people with them you can go and then as you walk along some will drop out others will come but you also only need you know we have in the village 1200 people constant disruptors are five it's enough to keep this going you never need everyone all the people you don't to get it started yes as a company you should align then your teams to this but you get it started it's enough you have a few what well, I'm, I'm excited about is, uh, I mean, you, you um, listened to um, our presentation in the afternoon, so you have a little insight about data analytics, AI, about the challenges. And I mean, the main question is here how, for especially data and AI guys, how you adopt those principles. Yeah, I think that will, that's the main challenge. For you. Do you, that would be a question yeah. to, to the audience, do you see any of those? Nine principles. Okay, ah, that, okay, that's something I immediately can apply to my data and AI transformation project. Practice over theory. Excuse me. Practice over theory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you were clearly saying this is at least what I yeah. understood. Maybe I misunderstood, but that you, with that type, yeah, yeah. are walking down this road that you want to drive transformation. So yes, you look at it from a data point. Yeah. Of you, but no transformation is happening without this. So this is the basic yeah. backbone uh, which you need for yeah. any kind of transformation. And I mean, it's interesting. Like, what was your initial uh, desire to go there and, and make this transformation? Because, like, you had this private land, and but this you just could even start with disruption, and it's a disruption, but. Uh, I feel like companies is often like this, okay, we don't want to transform. Maybe we say it, but uh, there's really resistance. So uh, I mean this when companies go for transformation, it needs to be a top-down approach. So and there are many companies are going like this, right? They they want this and then I think these principles are very, very helpful. Yes, there are many, even in the village yet. Yeah, Many people who say, not many, but there are people who say no. You will always have employees who say no. Mm -hmm. I used to work for 10 years with Synaxon. They are somewhere close to Gütersloh. They have uh, their disruptor, their skate park, was basically that they turned off all their internal communication system and they implemented a wiki. <laughs> Overnight. I mean, they prepared everything, and then the only communication tool which they had was a wiki. The wiki software where Wikipedia is built on. Uh, so, this was their disruptor. Uh, they also changed that the management had only veto rights. There were three of them, and they had veto rights. Everything else was uh, was decided by the employees. And these people, they had back then 150 employees, today they have close to 300. Uh, management never ever needed their vehicle. 30% of the employees left over the years and were replaced by people who better fit to this culture and it's working. So, uh, in my case, it was, um, all of this just happened. I mean, I never had the idea of going to India, building a skate park and doing these things. Uh, when I was building the skate park, they didn't even know what they were building. So we took the local labor, they were happy they didn't have to go anywhere. They could simply come in the morning and we would pay their cash. They didn't have 
you know, get an extra 50% deduction by some guy who would give them some work. So they all came and worked, but they didn't know what we were building. So when the thing was there, they still didn't know because they had no idea. You know, there was no radio, no television, no smartphones back then in the village. Uh, but they, when they saw that the kids then were going there, so what I did, we had a couple of tablets, and I downloaded YouTube videos because I couldn't show them. I can't skateboard. So <laughs> showed them videos, and then this is what you have to do. So we still have videos where they are sitting, you know, watching the videos, they go to the skate park, they try, it's not working out, they go back and watch the video. <laughs> so it's really like, you know, trial and error. But, and then when someone learned a trick, this kid would teach the others how to do it, and so uh, the pool crawled. And when, once the parents saw that this was somehow uh, giving the kids a different kind of freedom, there wasn't a big issue that they weren't allowed to come. And we were very lucky that Asha, the skater girl here, she was the very first right from the beginning that she said, no matter what, I want to skateboard. And she really paved the way for the girls there. And uh, for her, it, it's still until today, it was very painful process to tell her parents, no, I don't want to get married. Uh, and, you know, the villagers were really mean. They were putting pressure not only on Asha, but also on the family. Uh, I once took her to England, and while we were in England, in the newspaper, in the local newspaper, it was written that I had taken her out for R-rated movies. And so it, there was huge, huge, huge pressure. But uh, once you decide, once you have this strong me, that you want to do this because you feel this is what you want, you go for it. And that's important. And this is what, have, what this entire project and these nine principles, what they have given to the village is from this one of 700,000 nameless villages. This is one village in India which has clearly an identity. And no matter if the people like the project or not, but when they go to the next town and they say, oh, Chanwa again in the newspaper or on television, they all go like this, you know, they're all very happy. They are proud. Even though they would fight in the village <laughs> that certain things will not happen. But this identity is there. And this is very, very, very strong. And this is why this me, we thing there for companies, it's crucial. If you don't get this, if you don't support this uh, long term, I don't think it will work. But really, it's an interesting aspect because a lot of companies, they ask us as consultants, so what's your best practice? Uh, and if you do it the, the same thing as everyone else does, there is no competitive advantage in doing the analytics. So it's all about identifying the things other don't do and then do it or try it at least to be unique yeah because otherwise you're not competing and then for example we had this uh, long discussion today about ChatGPT. so ChatGPT is for everyone so everyone can use it and everyone will use it there is this not a, a com it's not not a way to compete in a, um, a competing market because everyone can use it and this that's why it's not really part of any strategy it's real strategy it's just a commodity that's it. And you can't shape an identity or make your name if you just do it everything right. as the other uh, companies do. And again, it becomes, this is what I was saying in the beginning, such transformation processes, they are a lot of work. Because you really have to go into these one-to-one <laughs> -one conversations, you know, you have to understand why this one is not moving forward and why this one is moving forward. What can you change? What kind of support do they need? 
And yeah. once you get this, it's the same. I mean, I had 80% of my time in the village was really talking to these people, not speaking their language. Very often, I mean, I had translator also, but to make them understand, and we were really coming from very, very different worlds. You know, if I said school, I had a very different idea of school than the parents. The parents of the kids, they've never seen a school from the inside, you know. None of the parents can read and write. Mm -hmm. So when they think they go into the government school, that's a school. Yes, it's a school, but it's miserable. Nothing comes out. So to, to match, first of all, this understanding, but then to, to talk to them and to get this understanding what they want for their kid and what we can offer, with the project we designed together, that's crucial. And then they will go for it. This is what we learned, you know. And this is why it became possible that we had a mix of Adivasi and Yada there at this open school project in Delhi. And that the parents went there and they slept together and ate together. And these things, they opened doors. You know, if five families are doing this, then the next step to 10, 15, it's pretty easy. Mm. And this is the same thing you do in a company. You just need it rolling. Please. Uh, what would you start? So first, this is so, so impressive. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> this is really valuable. And I, I just thought of one of, of uh, the long lasting projects we have. This company is doing exactly eight of these principles the opposite. <laughs> and, um, well, now it's clear why, why, why the progress is so slow, and the only answer they have is adding more people, which is not working. <laughs> um, but I, I have two questions, actually. The, the, the one is, I don't know whether I missed that, but where, where did the idea came from? So, you know, usually people, especially those not skating themselves, don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to do the skate park in India. No, no, no. So, where, where did this came from? And, this, and then maybe also you can transfer it to the second question because I'm always thinking that the difference probably between this story and the change story in the company is that in a, in a company, there is no only coming from outside and building a skate park. Rather, there, there's a strategy saying yeah. we need to change, or you can say, say you need to change. Yeah. And, yeah so, just so, the idea why a skate park, I was actually trying to explain. I came really from my background. I have a PhD in economics, and I was always working how to drive change. So I clearly come from the cultural point of view, from corporate culture. And the village has a certain kind of culture. As I was saying, it's a closed entity. Nothing comes in, nothing comes out. Everything is somehow predefined. When you're born a girl, you know, when you're 14, 15 years old, you're going to get married, you go to the village where your husband, your selected husband is coming from, you know, and then you serve this family. Everything is predefined. That's the culture of the village. My thought was, <coughs> I have a son, so he was never skateboarding, but he's a skater. He used to skate when he was little. And I always loved to look at these skateboarders in the cities. Skateboarding culture is the extreme opposite of what you have in this village. It has all these disobedience not mainstream, you know, these strong characters, at least they think they are, you know, these... Uh, so you have the extreme opposite. And then when you bring these things together, it was basically a clash of culture. And you need... What this clash created was movement. All of a sudden we had movement in the village. And you need movement to drive change. Right? With stand still, you can't drive change. So you need movement. And then your job is somehow to direct, to get the frame set right, that the movement go goes towards the direction you want them to move. 
So that's the answer to the first question, right? Uh, the second question is, uh, I don't believe any of these, that was actually also one of the reasons I left this entire industry, uh, because what I saw, most of the consultants out there, they do not go inside a company and say, I'm going to disturb you. They want to streamline with the management, they want to write their bills. They do not actually have an interest to really try to change. And it needs, and I also don't believe that really an external person can drive change within a company. You need the company people. And they need to do it on their own. This is why I was saying I did it with the villagers, not for them. Then it will work. And this is when you look around those companies who've really transformed themselves, you will exactly see this. And it's very difficult as a consultant to be disobedient, you know, and towards the people who should pay your bill. But, um, yeah, they I mean, don't if, like if it. you don't, as a consultant, do it, no one else will do it. Yeah, but look who is doing yeah. it. Yeah, but I mean, that, that's what, what I, for example, tell uh, the experts as an advice to so tell the client what he don't want to hear and not what he want to hear. Yes. Because if, if you're working in the company, you can't tell your boss that this is the wrong way to go or this is the wrong thing to do. But this but is if, where you need to go. Yeah, but if you are a consultant, I mean, you can't do it without losing your job. You are losing maybe your contract, but I mean there are other clients. So for a right. consultant, it's much easier to tell the people yeah, what they don't want to hear. Yeah, but it's difficult. At least it was yeah. like 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And I think on the positive side, I mean, also often in companies, consultants are hired to bring a difficult message because if people do it themselves, they will go their head. Yeah. yeah, there are that's, that's all possible. kind of ways yeah, of doing things, but I. At the end of the day, it's crucial that within the transformation pro process, employees are involved. Otherwise, it won't work. You can't come with, you know, some kind of model and push it in there and say, yeah. If they do not co-create with you, if they don't live it through with you, because in this I was quite amazed what I personally have learned from these people. You know, when, I mean, when it comes to nature, when it comes to doing certain kind of things, there is a lot these people know. There is a lot your employees know. But if you never give them a chance to show and to practice this, how will you ever know? There are also others. As I was saying, you will have the fact that People will leave the company because they don't like, you know, to work this way. That's a different kind of working. But then let them go and get those who better uh, suit your culture. So it's a it's an ongoing process, and the process or the the process itself will modify as you move forward. I think it's really an illusion to think that you can go like this, you know, and just cut. Yeah, so forget everything I told you in the office. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Never do that. <laughs> <laughs> but for, for me, the biggest question is, so what is, especially if you look at data and AI and analytics and data decision making and things like that, what is the disruptive element for those companies? So what could be a disruptive element you can I mean, it must be like a Trojan horse because if you As try to sell it to them, they would say, oh, no, no, I don't want that. But you have to, to yeah, like a Trojan horse, you have to, to put it inside the company and wait. And I think for consultants, this is very, very difficult. The examples I know, for example, yeah. Synaxon or this, uh, uh, what is this, this game engine, yeah. Valde, in, 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 in Chicago or San Francisco. They have a handbook for new employees. They really started from within. 
So the disruptive moment for Synaxon was really that they say from tomorrow onwards, only one communication tool, and that's a big key, which isn't really very user friendly. Mm. So they cut, this was the disruptive moment. So the management had made this decision, we're going to do this, and from there we go. They had their rules, so they opened up this new space, they had the rules that, you know, everyone could do anything. In the back end, they could control what they would do. Management only had veto, so they had their rules, like we had no school, no skateboarding girls first. They had this in place, and from there they went. This, uh, this game engine company, something with V, I think vendor or something like this, uh, handbook for new employees, you will find it on the internet. So they hire people, it's a management decision, they hire people not for a specific project or not for a specific function. They hire people that they fit to their culture. So the new employee is coming, he doesn't know what to do. He has a year time to find his place or her place within the company, let it be finance, let it be marketing, let it be programming, whatever. And from there they go. They can also switch. So they have given the employees a lot of space in taking responsibility. And it's working. I mean, they are world market leader. So can't be that long. So the disruption, I think the disruptive moment uh, it's tricky for, for an outstander. If I wouldn't have lived in the village, wouldn't have been there, a traditional NGO can't do this because they are not part of the life in the village. It wouldn't have worked. But it could be something like a technical tool, but also an organizational change. Yes. It must not be a skate park. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah of course. Yeah. This is why I was trying to give these two examples. Okay, well, because in my mind, this is also the felt experience. This is what I write about design thinking experience. Yes. And in the end, it's not often about the what actually comes out, but the whole process is a kind of disruptive process. It's practice over theory. It takes your, your resistances and walls and, and you experience it. Like it's not your theory. It's, it's you not only experience it, you live it through. Yeah. You know, there was very quickly we had this, this common desire that whatever they were uh, coming up with on projects, that they really wanted to make them happen. So even if there was resistance, and there always was resistance, you know, there was always the will to make it happen. So to compromise, to find, you know, the way. And this way is, it is organic, it's not straight. And sometimes you go, you go a step back, it happens, yes, and then you move forward again. That's part of the process. But you learn. So this is this resilience over strengths. You know, if you're not resilient, if you don't make space for yourself to, to allow mistakes, to give yourself time for reaction, if you only play the, you know, the macho kind of person, then you're lost. You need resilience in this process. And not someone to say, oh, you do this. Eh? So I'm now the one who says, let's go eat. But <laughs> <laughs> they're already waiting. So Thanks I, for listening. Yeah. Thank you very much.